Uh, very thankful for the invitation to be able to take a part in this uh, video or this uh, woke series. Uh, a lot of scary things can happen to us in our sleep. And we're going to take a look at that. I just think that's great, you know, it's what a prank. <laughs> there is a lesson there, though. The point is that when we're asleep, we're unaware. People can be up to all kinds of stuff in the way of pranks. It's a little more serious, though, a lot more serious, though, when it comes to what the devil can do to us when we are spiritually asleep. And so that's what this series, of course, has been dealing with, is being spiritually awake uh, awake to, in particular, the workings of what we've called the unholy trinity, the flesh, that's our illicit desires, the world, which is a system of values and ideas and teachings that run contrary to God in his will, and then the third being the devil, who is the one who works through the flesh and works through the world to try to destroy us. This morning, we're going to be looking at practical steps to overcoming sin in our lives. Practical steps. Underscoring the whole thing, though, is reliance upon the Holy Spirit. We're not talking about just a self-improvement kind of uh, situation, but the kind of steps we take that bring the Holy Spirit into our lives to empower us to overcome sin. So we're going to start with a prayer, please. Father, we thank you so much for this time of worship, uh, this time of Bible study. Uh, so thankful that you've given safe travel to everyone here. I pray, Father, now as we open up your word that you will lead us in your truth by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans 8, I'll start with Romans 8, 12 and 13. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So he says we are not indebted to the flesh, to these desires, these illicit desires. In fact, he had said earlier in chapter 8 that the law, the spirit of life, that's the gospel, freed us, delivered us from the law of sin and death. Sin has no claim on us in Jesus Christ. But we are in debt to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit regenerated us as Jesus purchased us by his blood. And so we are in debt, are obligated to live by the Spirit, uh, not by the flesh. We are to set our mind on the things of the Spirit, Paul said in Romans 8. The things of the Spirit, the things that the Spirit has revealed to us, the way of life to live. It's called a walk. And that is something that we are indebted or obligated to live by. But the question would be how? How do we draw upon the power of the Holy Spirit to put to death the practice of sin in our lives? Because that again is that last part of the verse where he says, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So that's what we're wanting to think about. How do we go about by the Spirit putting to death the deeds of the body? That is putting to death sin in our life. I've got four points. I've even come up with an acrostic to help us to remember. Maybe I like to give us something we can kind of take home in our head. So it's D-C-R-R, -R, detect sin, confess sin, repent of sin, and replace sin. And I've got the acrostic here, uh, David can really rock. See, that's Take each of those letters, D-C-R-R. -R. What I'm picturing there is when David played the harp before King Saul. Do you remember? King Saul was really taken by it. And I can imagine that King Saul in his head probably said, wow, that David can really rock. So anyway, remember that, as cheesy as it is, and see if it might help you to remember the points. D-C-R-R. -R. Detect, confess, repent, and replace. So we're going to look at detect sin, first of all. As we get older, we know that our medical providers want us to be examined. We start getting more tests, 
and mostly were being tested for cancer. And um, so we have exams like the colonoscopies, which are not real fun, but we know we've got to do that because we want to be able to, to detect the cancer. Well, Paul almost sounds like a medical provider when he says, and of course he's speaking spiritually, not not physically, but he says, and this is in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, if you'd like to write that down if you're taking notes, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it's not on the the slide. He says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. In other words, it's the idea of be sure sin has not crept into your life. Yeah, you're a Christian. Yeah, you go to church, but Is it possible that sin could have crept into your life? Examine yourselves. Test yourselves, he says. So the question would be, how do we go about doing that? Well, there's two ways, basically, that I want to bring to our attention. First of all, we do it by knowing and treasuring God's Word. Knowing, but just knowing the Word of God is not enough, is it? We have to treasure it. We have to value it. And uh, that's being addressed by Psalm 119, 9 through 11. He starts with a question here, how can a young man keep his way pure? A good question for all of us to ask, especially those in the youth. How can you keep your way pure, especially in the day and time we're living? And he answers it by saying, by guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So the Word of God identifies sin for us. It defines sin. And it also helps us to see sin in our life if, it has, if we've allowed that to happen. So it does help us to identify sin, and therefore it helps us to put sin away from our life whenever we find it's there. But that's not enough. It's not enough to simply grow in Bible knowledge to be able to detect sin. And we know that because from Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, Jeremiah 17, verse 9, um, it says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? And he's not asking for a show of hands, right? (laughs) He's not saying now some of us can actually know what's in our heart. No, he's saying, that's a rhetorical question. He's saying, you don't know. We cannot detect on our own sin that's in our life. We've got to have help, right? So the Lord says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. God can do what we cannot do. He can see those things deeply embedded in our heart, motives maybe, that we don't see. Now, what's, what we need to do is recognize, well, I'll do that in just a minute. But psychologists tell us that we have defense mechanisms. Anyone ever heard of that? Defense mechanisms. There's about 12 of them. But there's one of them that's called projection. Projection. Let's say I find that I, I just don't really want to have something to do with one of the members here. You know, for whatever reason, I just decide I just don't like them. I want nothing to do with them. Well, then my heart says, well, if, if Don really grasps that, he's going to feel guilty. And we're going to protect him from that guilt. So we're going to turn things around and say that that guy doesn't like Don. That that guy wants nothing to do with Don. We're going to make Don think that really that guy wants nothing to do with him. Not that Don doesn't want anything to do with him. You see, it just, and the whole point is, and psychologists will tell us, our heart is trying to protect us from feeling guilty. It's just trying to protect, it doesn't want us feeling guilty. So it comes up with these defense mechanisms. And the, the thing is, these are at the subconscious level, subconscious level, not conscious of them, but they're still there. So here's where the next passage comes in. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts, and see if there be any 
grievous way in me and, and lead me in the way everlasting. So here we're saying, okay, God, you say you search my heart. You say you test my mind. Okay, God, do that with me. Do that with me. Search my heart. Test my mind and, and reveal to me the stuff I can't see. If I've got sinful motives, reveal that to me. That's a scary prayer, though, isn't it? Isn't that scary? Where you're saying, God, bring me face to face with what I'm actually thinking? Bring me face to face with sinful motives that I don't see? That's scary. But at the same time, that's necessary for us to overpower Satan, his influence over us in that way. So how might he do that? How might that prayer be answered where we're saying basically reveal to me these hidden sins? Well, I believe it's possible that the Lord would stir up or put into the heart of a brother or sister in Christ, one who is spiritual, that is spiritually mature, put it into their heart to come to us and talk to us about that. I think the Holy Spirit is able to give insights to members to say, uh, you need to go talk to your brother about that. Or it might be that the Holy Spirit simply brings that sin out from the subconscious into the conscious so that we actually see it, we recognize it. There's any number of ways that the Lord might answer that prayer, but the point is we need help from the Holy Spirit. That's the whole point. We need help from the Holy Spirit in detecting sin as he spells out sin, but then we need his help at a deeper level where he helps us see the stuff that's hidden in our subconscious, the stuff that our heart is trying to protect us from. Okay. All right, so that's the D, that's the detect sin. Second one is confess sins. Confess those sins then that the Holy Spirit has brought to our consciousness. The word confess translates from the Greek word homo logeo. Homo logeo. Homo meaning same, logeo to speak. And the idea is that we've sinned and God says we've sinned. So when we confess, we're speaking the same thing that God speaks. We're saying the same thing. God says, you sin, I say, I sinned, I confess. So it's to speak the same thing. There's another expression found in the Bible that's really interesting, though, where instead of saying confess sin, they say give glory to God. Give glory to God. How does that tie in? Well, the idea is it's an acknowledgement when we confess sin that God knows me and he knows that I've sinned. It's a confession that God is omniscient, that he knows all, he reads hearts. So when we confess sin, we're glorifying God in the way of saying, God, you have this ability and I know you've seen the sin. Uh, Joshua, back Old Testament times, Israel encircled, marched around Jericho, the walls fell down. There's a man named Achan among the Israelites who went into the city, stole silver and gold, hid it in his tent. He sinned. God moved Joshua to confront him. Listen to what Joshua said. He said to Achan, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Give glory to God. In other words, God knows what you did. Now glorify him by confessing it, by acknowledging that he knows your heart and he knows what you did. So the question comes up, who do we confess sins to? Well, first of all, we confess sins to God. Every sin is ultimately against God, isn't it? So we're going to confess to God. We will also confess our sins to people that we hurt by our sins. Go to people that you know you hurt. Tell them, I'm sorry. I, uh, forgive me. Or there are people that maybe we have influenced to sin by the sin we committed. That is, we were a stumbling block to them. We affected them. Or you go to them. We go to them and we say, I am sorry Forgive me, I, I should not have done that. But then we also are, should confess our sins to ourselves, shouldn't we? If we don't acknowledge the fact that we've sinned, then we're not going to go beyond confessing it. That is, we will uh, not repent of it. And that's our next step here. Psalm 32 says this, Psalm 32 
Now, David, background here, David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, and for some time he did not confess it. And during that time that he didn't confess it, he tells us what he went through, and it was misery. Not just that he was separated from God, but his, his body actually wore from it. He suffered physically, psychologically, and spiritually. So here's what David said there. He said, when I kept silent, that is about his sin, didn't confess it. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. I just lost all strength. I, it got where it just wore me down. Anyone relate to that? Guilt will do that. But then he confessed his sin to God. He said, I acknowledge my sin to you, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Through God's mercy and love, we confess and he forgives. And he had begun the psalm by saying, how blessed is the one who then, whose sins are forgiven, whose sins are covered. So God forgives us when we confess and we enjoy relief, we enjoy blessing as God forgives us. So there's the C. We've got detect the <clears throat> C, confess the sin. Third point, repent. Confessing sin should then lead right in to repenting of our sins. The word repentance comes from a Greek word, metanoia, metanoia. It's a Greek word that means literally meta change, noia from the word nous meaning mind. So literally repentance is a changing of our mind. Now, how dramatic is that change? How dramatic is it? How dynamic is it? I like to compare it with another word that we're probably more familiar with that we came across in biology and it's metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. Meta change, morphosis, form, not mind, but form. Now, I want to look at an example of the metamorphosis of a butterfly. We've got a slide here. The butterfly. Is there much change? Is it very dramatic, the change from the egg to the butterfly? You'd say, yeah, it's quite a bit of change, quite a bit of difference. That butterfly is a whole lot prettier than that old egg. In fact, there's quite a bit of difference even between the, the, the pupa or the larva and the butterfly and then between the pupa and the butterfly. A lot of significant change. Now, let's back up. Metanoia. How much change are we talking about? It's pretty drastic, actually. Metanoia, repentance, actually involves a pretty big dramatic change because we're turning from living for self to living for God. We're turning from practicing sin to practicing righteousness. That's a pretty big change. And then that's going to ma manifest itself, of course, in a changed behavior. Now, what drives it? What drives our repentance? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, for godly grief or sorrow, and I'm going to use the word sorrow especially, Godly sorrow produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Now, first of all, let's recognize that repentance is not simply being sorry. Sometimes we think of that. If I'm really sorry I did something, then that means I've repented. No, no, not really. And in fact, though there's sorrow that leads to repentance, not every kind of sorrow is going to lead to repentance. If a person is sorry because he got caught doing the offense, sorry he got caught, or sorry because of the consequences of his sin, that's not really going to lead to repentance. Even if we're sorry that we hurt someone by our sin, and we should feel sorry for that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we repent. It might, uh, I might point to Judas Iscariot. You read Matthew 27. Did you know he was sorry? He betrayed Jesus. He felt regret that he had betrayed an innocent man. But that wasn't repentance. He didn't repent. The only kind of sorrow that leads to repentance is a sorrow towards, towards God. And that's what Paul is saying here, godly sorrow. Where we say, God, I have sinned 
against you above anybody else. And that's what David said in Psalm 51 about his sin with Bathsheba. Against you, you alone, I have sinned. Since sin is most against God, then our sorrow for us, for it to lead to repentance, must be towards God. I must be feeling sorry that I offended God, that I violated His will. That's the kind of sorrow that will be effective in leading then to repentance. Now, I want to spend just a few minutes on dealing with the point that I think is maybe a little more delicate. But we must be awake, especially to what the Bible describes as sins that we're more vulnerable to. And that's going to change from person to person. There are certain sins that each of us are tempted by more than maybe others are tempted by. In Hebrews 12 and verse 1, I believe he's talking about that kind of sin. He says, lay aside the sin which clings so closely. The sins that cling so closely. He says, literally the Greek says, the sin that easily surrounds us. A sin before, even before we commit it, we're thinking about it. And we can't, we, we don't put it away. We keep thinking about it. We, we toy with the idea. And we tell ourselves, I'm not going to do that sin. But, but then we entertain the idea. And we fantasize about it even. He says, lay that aside. Maybe I can illustrate it this way. When I was a young, when I was about 13 or 14, I, I loved wild things. I just loved wild things, wild animals. I had a, a pet skunk for a while and um, named him Squirt Blossom. Squirt Blossom, that seemed to fit him pretty good. Uh, but then I was hunting with my dad and my brothers and I, I caught a rattlesnake. I caught a baby, a baby rattlesnake. And I fully intended to take him home, and he was going to be my pet. I put him in a little cardboard box. Uh, by the way, I grew up in Texas, a lot of snakes out there. I put him in a cardboard box, and somebody stepped on the box, and he got away. But anyway, so I'm just kind of imagining, though, what I probably would have done if I had actually taken the snake home. I would have gotten a big glass case, put it outside, out back behind the house. Mother would never have allowed me to keep it in the house for some reason. But anyway, I would keep it outside in a glass case, and every day when I come from home from middle school, I know I would just run right over to that glass case, and I would look at that snake. In fact, we can take a look. Now, isn't that a pretty snake? That's a Western Diamondback Rattler, okay? I mean, look at the diamonds on that thing. That's just pretty, isn't it? That's very attractive. The head, there's that triangular head, the head of a, head of a, a, a deadly pit viper. But anyway, a very pretty head. And then there's the rattles, which I always loved when I was growing up. And I see a rattlesnake, I was just taken by those rattles for some reason. So anyway, I would come home from school, I know, and I would, I would look through that glass every day. And I would probably talk to the snake and stuff. But I would tell myself I will never pick him up because he would bite me and I would die. So I'm, I'm never going to pick him up. So day after day, I come and I just look at him, enjoy him. And then the day comes where I realize, you know, I want more than that. I just want more. I, I, I want to be able to just, just touch him, just touch him, you know. And so one day, I notice he looks like he's asleep, so I just kind of reach in, and I would probably touch one of those diamonds, and I'd just pull my hand back. And then maybe another day after school, I'd go, and I would, I would, I would touch him again. And that would be okay for a while, but then I'd find myself, even though I'd said, you know, I'm never going to pick him up because he would bite me and he'd, he'd kill me. I would still come to that point where I would think, I, 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 I want more. I, I, I want to pick him up. I just want to pick him up. And I would probably maybe pick up the tail real quick and then drop it. And, and, and then the next day, I would probably just pick up a little bit more. Then he would turn around and he would bite me and I would die. Right? That's how that would work. Right? <laughs> In fact, that's probably why it was that God didn't let me keep the snake to begin with. Probably is why I lost it out on the hunting range. But, but the point is, that's kind of how it is with these sins that encircle us. Adulterous affairs develop just like that. Adulterous affairs. Where we say, I'm a Christian, I would never have an affair like that. 
But then we go to work, we go to school, or we go to the health spa, and there's somebody we see, and we're just drawn to them. They're just so attractive, and we just can't help ourselves. And we, we start thinking about them and thinking about them day after day. We just, they're on our mind. And we, we tell ourselves now, we'll never go to bed with that person, but at the same time, uh, we entertain the thought. We fantasize about it. So then one day, we... You know, we make it a point to kind of sit by them or we pass by them and we say something and we communicate with our eyes our interest. And then they respond. And then we start carrying on kind of a conversation at first. And then before long, it's flirting. It's flirtatious, really. But again, we say, I'm never going to go to bed with that person, but, you know, a little bit innocent flirting. That's okay. And then one day after workout or school or work, you know, one of you says, hey, let's, uh, let's go down to City Brew. Let's grab a cup of coffee. You think, well, you know, I'm not going to go to bed with a person, but I'll, 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 I'll have coffee with them. And so we go and have coffee together. And, and then there's another, you know, the next day after your workout, well, let's, let's go get a cup of coffee again. And then one day you go in there, and it's packed. It's got a bunch of people. So you think, wait, what, what if I just, you just, just go to my house? Let's go to my house. We'll just sit in the dining room, and we'll, we'll enjoy our coffee together. No, no more than that. And we tell ourselves no more than that, because if I, if I went to bed with a person, that would be wrong. Of course, after a while, the, the meeting in the dining room would end up in the bedroom, right? And then the snake would bite, it would bite. That's how this sin works. It's not overnight. It just starts with entertaining it, thinking about it, playing with it. I, I really like the Greek language uh, that the Bible is written in because it's more, uh, more nuanced. It has more specific uh, features about it. And the, one of the features that comes into play here is called the Greek uh, errorist imperative. The errorist tense, imperative mood. Aorist is the tense we do not have in English, it just, but it is in Greek, and it's more point action, point action. Imperative means a command. And so that's what we find here in Hebrews 12 and verse 1, and the idea is that it is point action, it's not stretched out, it's not dragged out. It's very decisive, it's very concise. So when he says, lay aside this sin, He's saying make a decision, a firm decision, and do it. Don't stretch it out. Lay aside the sin. I think of, uh, if you're watching football games, you know there'll be the ball carrier running down the sideline, and, and a tackler is pursuing him. He finally catches up with him, he, but he tries to tackle high, and then the ball carrier does that. We call it a stiff arm. That. That's point action. That's the idea. We just drop him like that. That's the nature of this tense and this uh, imperative aorist. Colossians 3.5 also uses it. Colossians 3.5, when he says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And put to death is aorist imperative. That is, do it decisively. When he's talking about quit these sins, put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is, an idol which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. So he's saying, take these sins, and I might say coming from Texas, take this sin out behind the barn and you shoot it. You just shoot it. Kill it. You don't entertain it. You don't think about it. You don't say, well, I'm going to just mess with it a little bit and then I'm not going to do it. Just take it out behind the barn and shoot it. That's the idea. That's the aorist imperative. There's a song I've got to use to illustrate. Uh, Micah introduced us to Paul Simon uh, several uh, weeks ago. And uh, there's another song that they wrote. And it's, to me, almost like Paul Simon has Hebrews 12.1 right out in front of him opened up. It's the song, you're probably familiar, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. You guys remember that one? 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. And uh, what it's about is you have an unfaithful husband, and he confides to his wife that he's been having a, this affair, and he's asking for her advice in how to break it off. How do you do it? 
And she's very amazingly understanding, amazingly patient. And she actually tells him. She says, okay, but she's very gentle about it. And she says, basically, you need to just don't complicate it. Keep it simple and keep it short. Keep it decisive. Okay, I'm going to sing the chorus. Okay, we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, I need, your, I need a beat, though. You guys help me out. Mm -hmm. Just slip out the back, Jack. Make a new plan, Stan. You don't need to be coy, Roy. You just listen to me. Hop on the bus, guys. You don't need to discuss much. Just drop off the key and get yourself free. See that? That's aorist imperative, okay? Thank you. <laughs> But see, that's true of every sin that clings to us, not just, not just uh, adultery. Every sin we just need to put away. And again, when I'm talking about putting sin away, I'm not talking about just some mental willpower thing that we do. It's relying upon the Holy Spirit, Spirit power to do that. Because we cannot do that on our own. And we will always fail if that's how we're trying to do it. By the Spirit, again, Paul said, Romans 8, 13, by the Spirit, we're putting to death the deeds of the body. The last one. So we've got D, detect, C, confess, R, repent, and then R, replace. Replace the sin. We've, you've probably heard the expression that life abhors a, a vacuum. Life abhors a vacuum. If you stop something bad going on, you've got to replace it with something good. Otherwise, the bad returns. It'd be like you're trying to put in a yard and you clean out all the weeds, but you better plant the grass or the weeds are going to grow back, right? So that's the way effective change happens in our life is by not just stopping the bad, but replacing the bad with the good. And here's where we come to Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> I'm going to begin reading in verse 16, Galatians 5:16. Paul says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. There's two things in us. There's the flesh. There are desires to sin. We've all got them, and we're all going to have them until we die. Until Jesus returns we're going to have them. The only way we're going to be become a veteran of this war is, is after we die, right? So you have the, the flesh saying, sin, sin, sin. And then we have the Holy Spirit given to us when we were saved. He dwells within us. And according to James in James 4, he je jealously desires us. The Holy Spirit says, no, 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 you belong to me. You belong to me. You don't listen to the flesh. Jesus purchased you from me. And so there's this war going on for the rest of our life. Flesh is saying, sin. Holy Spirit says, no, bear my fruit. Now, here's the thing. He says, walk by the Spirit and you won't carry out the desire of the flesh. That is, the Holy Spirit is more powerful than the flesh. So we make a decision to submit to the Holy Spirit, to live the way He says to live. And when that happens, He empowers us to overcome the sin, no matter what it was. We need to recognize the power of the Spirit when we submit. When we say, okay, here's how you want me to live, and I'm going to obey that, relying on your power. And so I've got just a few examples from, because he goes on to list the deeds of the flesh, that's sins that we commit if we listen to the flesh. And then there's the fruit of the Spirit, which if we walk by the Spirit, that's what's produced in our life. And so let's take a look at just a few examples. This is from those passages. For example, on the deeds of the flesh side, he says strife or quarreling and jealousy. Let's say that we're involved and in, in, just we're always fighting with people. We're arguing with them and we're quarreling with them. But then we say, Holy Spirit, I'm done with that. I'm repenting and I want your power in my life to produce your fruit. So, 
Holy Spirit, I'm going to begin practicing love. And through all of this, by the way, we have to go into action. We've got to step out in obedience, and then the Holy Spirit comes alongside us and empowers us in that obedience. So we say, Holy Spirit, I will now start, instead of arguing with people and quarreling, I will practice love towards them. I will begin looking after their needs and their welfare. And I'll do it every day that I can. And I, I will try to, the joy that you've given me, I'm going to try to share with them. I'm going to bring them into your joy. And so we do that day after day. And the Holy Spirit not only kills the quarreling, but he produces that fruit, his fruit in us. Outburst of anger. Let's say we just go around and we're hot-headed. You know, we're, we just blow up at the least provocation. And so we say, that's sinful. Uh, Lord, Holy Spirit, I'm done with that. I want your help killing that. And I want your help producing your, your fruit. And so we say, we are going to, we're going to uh, be at peace with others. Uh, Paul said, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. And so here's someone always uh, blowing up, and, but he says, now I'm going to start being at peace with people. And I'm going to begin practicing the patience of the Holy Spirit. So as we practice these things, then the Holy Spirit comes alongside, empowers us to be successful in that. Then there's the enmities, just going around mad, going around judging people all the time, uh, being mad at people all the time. And so we say, I'm repenting of that. Holy Spirit, empower me to exercise your kindness, your goodness, your patience. Empower me, Holy Spirit. And he does. He does that. And on and on. The sexual impurity, sensuality, drunkenness. We're saying, Holy Spirit, I'm done with those things. I repent of those things. I will now begin to practice your self-control. I'm going to start controlling my thoughts. But with your help. And I'm going to start practicing faithfulness. You know, when you, when you have sexual immorality going on, you're, you're betraying that person. You're not being faithful to them. You're not being good to them. You're betraying them. And so what the Holy Spirit says, practice faithfulness towards everyone. So that will, again, that fruit will be produced within us, and it will be the counter to the sexual immorality. So the point is, with all this, is we walk by the Spirit, we submit to the Spirit, we say, Spirit, I will do as you want me to do, trusting in my, in my Lord. And then the Holy Spirit comes alongside and He empowers us in that obedience. Also, Ephesians 3.16 is important for us to keep in mind. When we, the Bible encourages us to actually pray for the power of the Spirit. You ever think about doing that? Yeah, yeah. We've got the Holy Spirit within us. He dwells in our inner man. He was given to us when we were saved. And he's saying, pray for that Spirit to work powerfully within us. In fact, this passage here is kind of amazing because he's talking about for us to understand and comprehend all, comprehend all the dimensions of Christ's incredible love. The Holy Spirit has to empower us to do that. And he can. He can. He can do beyond what we ever ask or even think, he says, in that passage. Wow. So, praise team, if you would come up, please. If I could have the worship team come up. So, again, four things. David can really rock, right? Okay? So, we've got detect sin, confess sin, repent of sin, and replace sin. Sometimes, though, it, there's some sin in our life that we've done so long, we think it's just impossible for us to put it aside. We feel like it's a part of our DNA. It's like I'm always going to be doing this and I'm helpless. No, that's, that's not really true. It might seem impossible to us, but the things that are impossible to us, are they impossible to God? Absolutely not, right? Absolutely not. There's an example from the Old Testament I like to draw on. Just to show, too, that this power of the Spirit, you can learn about that in the Old Testament. It's effective, even in Old Testament times. The Babylonians had destroyed the Jewish temple. And, and then about 536, God sent the Jews out of Babylon uh, back to their homeland of Jerusalem and said, 
rebuild my house, rebuild my temple. So they began rebuilding it. They laid the foundation. Everything's going great. But the enemies, the surrounding people who were enemies, resisting every way they could, they finally got the Jews in trouble with the Persian king, Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes put a stop to it. He made a law that says to them, it's illegal from here on for you to rebuild that temple. So God's people thinking they're whipped now, thinking, well, it's impossible, can't do it anymore. They, for 15 years, sat on their hands. They just sat there. And then God stirred up his prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. He sent Haggai to him, Haggai 2 verse 4, and God says, take courage, don't the Jews, take courage and work for I am with you. My spirit is abiding in your midst. All right, go back to work and you think it's impossible, but understand something here. My Holy Spirit is with you. And then Zechariah comes along, Zechariah 4, 6 and says, not by might, not by power, that is not by human power, not by human might, but by my spirit. Basically, he says, you're going to be successful. So it's not left up to you. Now, we need to understand that that same power that was at work, giving them success in the rebuilding of that temple. And by the way, if you want to read about that, the end of the story is Ezra 5 and 6. Ezra chapter 5 and 6. A great story. I'd like to, for you to read to see just how the Holy Spirit did it. How did, he, how did he do it? How did he empower them to success? But what I want us to realize is that, that same power of the Holy Spirit that gave them success against the world ruler, Artaxerxes, is the same power that hundreds of years ago raised Lazarus from the dead. It's the same Holy Spirit power that raised Jesus from the dead. And it's the same Holy Spirit power that's going to raise you and me from the dead and give us bodies of glory. Isn't that wonderful? Is that powerful enough, you think, to kill our sin? I think so. I sure think so. Little children, John says, 1 John 4, verse 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is what? Can anyone finish it for me? He who is in you is what? Greater than he who is in the world. Amen. Right? We've got to think that. We've got to realize that promise. It's true. We see it carried out over and over throughout Bible times. Let's pray. Father, we thank and praise you for your grace and mercy towards us in Jesus Christ. We're thankful for a hope that we never could have had had you not sent your son to die for us on the cross and give us that, that offering for sin that paid the requirement of the law so that we might live. Father, we're thankful that you gave us the Holy Spirit when we were saved to empower us to become transformed into the image of your son. Father, help us to call upon and to draw upon, to tap into the power of the Holy Spirit as we seek to live for you from day to day, helping us realize that there is no challenge too great, there is no sin too big to be overcome by your power. Father, continue with us, we pray in Jesus' name.